remember it was the dawn of mindless Beatlemania, non-judgmental Beatlemania. Anybody that's four guys in long hair, you scream, and the DJs are telling you to do that. That's what you have to do. And so... A harmonica player out of the Cambridge, Massachusetts folk and jug band scene of the early 1960s, John Sebastian went on to form one of the most influential bands of the 60s and 70s, The Love and Spoonful, as well as later having a major hit with the theme song from Welcome Back, Cotter. We met John Sebastian at his home in Woodstock, New York. John, you came from a really musical family, didn't you? I did, yes. I, very lucky. Your dad was a classical harmonica player, is that That's right? That's right. Uh, the best that's ever been. Uh, really remarkable player. And that explains you picking up the, the harp early on in your life? Yeah, in, in a funny kind of a sideways way. Uh, you know, Dad would go to Trussingen and they'd get the Honer uh, 64 chromatic instruments and refine them and stuff, and then he'd bring home the little marine bands, and, of course, that was what I was playing you know, when I was five, it's still what I play. <laughs> I was going to say the Honor Marine Band is the classic. I have a couple lying around my house, too. Yeah. 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 Now, now, your house was a very, you got exposed to a lot of musical legends, as it turns out, when it, you were young, right? Yeah. It, uh, in retrospect, it was fantastic. I wish I'd known then. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Uncle Burl turned out to be Burl Ives, and Uncle Burl asked uh, my dad to house uh, this. Oklahoma songwriter that was going to be considered a genius someday, but couldn't find lodging right now. <laughs> and that was Woody Guthrie. A couple of weeks, uh, he was in our guest room. And But this is all when I was really small. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I was under five for all of this because it all happened on Bank Street, which is where I was brought when I was born. Right. Now, you know, I, I remember when <clears throat> the Spoonful first came on the scene, and my friends and I, who were all, you know, uh, weekend folkies at that point, right? yeah, yeah. we rolled our own cigarettes with one hand and, you know, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and we all went, hang on a second, Love and Spoonful, that's, a, that's Mississippi John Hurt these guys are doing. And that's what it was, right? You were influenced by uh, definitely. John Hurt. Oh, yeah. No, the name, actually, I have to give credit to Fritz Richmond, our, our wonderful wash tub and jug player, now deceased, but uh, who uh, quizzed me as I was getting that band together. And so, well, what are you going to call it? And I said, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I really don't know yet. He says, well, what's it sound like? I said, well, ideally, it's going to be like uh, Chuck Berry filtered through Mississippi John Hurt. And without a pause, he said, why don't you call it the Love and Spoonful? <laughs> I never knew that. Fritz Richmond. Hold it down. Fritz. Cow. Now, you were, not, well, and let's, let's, Reel it back to before that the band was formed when you were doing well you were you were basically a session man playing harp on a lot of people's albums. I know that Tom Rush's first album, which I still have on vinyl, yeah, uh, you're basically one of the main guys on that album. I'm the harp player on a yeah. few of those things. Yeah, and you play. Who else do you play behind? Uh, Judy Collins, uh, and then uh, the guy. The people weren't as famous, but they were. Badass, uh, Timmy Harden, Freddie Neal, and Vince Martin, uh, and uh, Johnny Hammond, because uh, he and I grew up on the same street, so right. we, we really had uh, a friendship by the time we were 16. Right. You played uh, on Bleeker and McDougal, Fred Neal's album, is that right? You, yes, that's right. Did you play on any others, or just that one? There right. was a previous album by Martin and Neal called Tear Down the Walls, also an Electra, also a Paul Rothschild production mm -hmm. that I uh, was part of. Okay, so all of this was happening, and you're involved, you were involved with the Even Dozen Jug Band. Yep. Um, that was all... the dawn. Yeah. J just for sequence here, Okay. Uh, I guess it's 62... Um, uh, my pal Stefan Grossman calls me and says, we're starting this jug band and you're in it. Uh, I didn't even didn't know. didn't ask you, he told you. Yeah, yeah no, okay. he told me. And, uh, it wasn't even a I didn't even know what jug band music was technically at that point. Uh, but 
Through that encounter, I met Paul Rothschild, and he and I became fast friends very fast, and uh, he began to use me as a kind of uh, accessory for recording folk artists, particularly uh, partially because of my relationship with Felix Papalardi, because we played with Fred Neal extensively, Timmy Harden extensively. And so uh, when it was time to go into the studio with Fred, the assembly was uh, Felix and I. Right, right. And, uh, now, this just, this just occurred to me, and this sounds like an, a, an aside, a tangent, but I, I'm curious about this. You said you and John Hammond were good buddies. Yes. So John Hammond starts recording his stuff, and not only is he playing his own harp, but when he wasn't playing his harp, it wasn't you playing, it was Charlie Musselwhite playing, if I remember correctly. Why weren't you backing him up on his records? Well, I, I know I wasn't, uh, and I would certainly defer to Charlie Musselwhite <laughs> if he was going If it was time to play the blues, I might go, you know, I'm, I'm going to watch. Okay. Uh, well, that's not entirely. Don't sell yeah. yourself short. Night Owl Blues is a pretty damn good harp song. So. I, you know, uh, definitely uh, have had my, uh, my opportunities <laughs> and some, some nice moments in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly have uh, utmost respect for... Muscle white and his whole thing. He he puts me away. Tell me about the uh, the Cambridge. What's come to be referred to as the Cambridge years, when all those clubs were operating in that in that area of Massachusetts and Boston and stuff. And and I mean that would seem to me at the time to just to have been Nirvana when it came to being a musician. There was a, there was cross fertilization going on all over the place. Yes, uh, it it. It must have been amazing. I was only occasionally there. Yeah. Remember that I more or less represent a kind of an oppositional force to Cambridge and that scene. By that I mean that uh, uh, f Cambridge particularly was into the rabid separation of genres. And, right. oh, if you like this, then you can't like that. And Ooh, the Kingston Trio, that would be really bad. And, uh, oh, Bascom, Lamar, Lunsford, okay, you can stay. Uh, you know, and that kind of mood really permeated. And, in fact, when the Spoonful eventually, uh, you know, this is a few years later, yeah. formed and went up and played uh, in Cambridge, we we took it as, like, we wanted to take both ears and the tail. We just wanted to kill him up there, and, and uh, did you? And and uh, pretty much put him away. Pat, uh, there was one lady up front who looked at Zal as the set began and went <laughs> like that, and he went <laughs> like that. <laughs> Turn it to eleven. Right? Turn it all the way up. <laughs> that, that that was our message to Cambridge. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so at the beginning, when the spoonful is together at the beginning, and you're you you started out. I thought it was interesting the way that, um, the sort of way that you moved from. You didn't change genres necessarily, but when you started, there was a lot of jug band music influence and a lot of folk lyric influence. And then somewhere in there, uh, it became real straight ahead rock and roll pop songs. Like like there was a shift somewhere. Um, were you conscious of that at the time? Did you? No, realized you were going uh, from one to the other? What I was conscious of was immediately running out of original material <laughs> right. and, and going, what now? And uh, so really the sequence was more like, oh, here's a couple pop tunes. Oh, and I can't remember any pop <laughs> tunes. Oh, here's some derivative uh, jug band uh, revamps. And, uh, uh, and then, then it began to smear a little bit more. And, yeah. And, yeah. Well, I, I own, I think, one of the uh, collections of the Spoonful stuff that has like every alternate take and you know every outtake and all of that stuff. And, and I was listening to it in preparation for coming to talk to you. And, and it amazed me when I when I listened to it like all the way through in one fell swoop, how much stuff there was in there that I recognized from. The folk years previous, like it, not just tunes, but sometimes full lyrics and everything. You guys were covering, it seemed to me, everything as well as doing your own stuff. You know, it it was a band that really we did have a wide swath of territory that we felt we could uh, contribute to. Yeah. What about the writing? Was that a? Um, did you do it with the rest of the guys in the band? Was it 
a solitary thing for you? How did that work? I'd have to say uh, a, a major portion of it was solitary. But I did have uh, Steve Boone as a collaborator on a couple of key tunes, like You Didn't Have to Be So Nice. My brother was the originator of the chorus of Summer in the City. Uh, Steve p contributed the little instrumental uh, middle of that tune. Uh, uh, and as far as Zalman went, he was a unique character because he felt songwriting was kind of a corny thing to do. It, it, just <laughs> embarrassing, really. But it didn't bother him to annoy me into writing songs. And so our technique was much more often like conversations that would start like I would have no idea where the thing was going and then I would realize oh he wants me to write a song about Nashville cats or something like that and then I'd try to write the funniest thing I could come up with and uh, and that's when Zalman would become the greatest cheerleader you could ever have and just keep going and saying no this is yeah so how did you and Zal get together to begin with? Well, uh, Zal always insists that it was at the Purple Onion, and I don't recall it, and that's when he would berate me about my memory. But in fact, the real memorable moment was uh, I was now friends with Cass Elliot and the Big Three, and that was evolving into the Mugwumps, and Cass said, you have to come over and watch the Beatles on Ed Sullivan with me. Ringo's going to be there. I said, you mean Ringo's going to be at the Ed Sullivan? No, no. Ed, uh, Ringo's going to be at my house. So because when Cass said something, there was always a good reason to figure out what she was saying, I went to her apartment and... Uh, the 20s, and uh, sure enough, a very tall Russian Jewish version of Ringo was there, if you recall, at that <laughs> yes. moment. Zal's hair was pretty Ringo like, and the prominent nose, and uh, so we began playing that evening just watching the Beatles, and now we're just sort of playing. And the, and and it was, you know, what it was really like was like 16-year-old girls because <laughs> after that encounter, I left, and then I called Cass right back. And I said, that is the most unusual guitar player I've ever heard. Oh, and she calls me back and says, oh, well, Zal says... You're the steadiest guitar player he ever heard. <laughs> this that is was, like 16-year-old girl. It <laughs> is. It is. Like, you know, so they, they exactly. So, and it did pr pr present uh, the beginning of a friendship. Um, I was at that time occasionally making uh, real records with Paul Rothschild, but also toy records with Eric Jacobson, which wouldn't go anywhere or be released, but mm. which were sort of us trying to learn how to be in the studio and do all that kind of stuff. Okay. So uh, uh, the mugwumps then form, but are obviously a constructed band as opposed to something that starts organically. They don't have internal songwriting or internal playing all the way down. So the first time they actually play a real rock and roll club, they realize that their life is limited. And that's when Cass and Denny kind of go off and, and we don't know what's going to happen to them. We're all semi-living at the Albert Hotel. Uh, so we know day to day, oh, well, Cass is not around. Eh? She might be uh, auditioning or something. And she, I don't know, Denny, what's going to happen to Denny? We don't know. And, uh, of course, uh, another six months, I guess, while the Spoonful were getting our thing together in New York, that's when all of the, the you know, much more well-known sequence of events yes. that happened as Cass 
follows John and Mitchie out to uh, the islands yeah. and, and as as they have now made immortal in song and lyric gets the whole job thing. and yeah. everything absolutely. Yeah. So you guys, at what point for you did you think when you were, when the spoonful was together and playing? At what point did you think, holy cow, we're like a we're a major band now? So I'd have to say the change really came as an aftermath of the Rose Bowl, which the Spoonful played with the Turtles. And it was one of those kind of, uh, you know, the Beach Boys. And there were yeah. like six or eight acts in this thing, and we played it. Uh, and, you know, we, we had rented a, a Hertz car. It was actually a convertible. Drove over to the Rose Bowl, you know, kind of get out of the car, knock on the big huge wooden gates and they open it up we go in we do the show we have all kinds of trouble and these damned beetle amplifiers I hate English amplifiers and, just, ah. and to play an auto harp through it is just a tragedy so I'm all ready to go uh, we're, we're we bombed you know uh, we, we get off of there well we get back in the car and the big doors open, and 80 people jumped into our car. <laughs> I mean... These are fans. It was incredible, yeah. uh, and it was very scary because, you know, you, you never realize how well-made a T-shirt really is until <laughs> somebody takes one and tries to rip it off neck first. Uh, mm, Joe Butler had a... Saint, uh, 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 some kind of a crucifix or something mm -hmm. uh, that got ripped off of him. And, and there were scissors flying around really? in this crowd, people trying to cut your hair. Remember, it was the dawn of mindless Beatlemania, non-judgmental <laughs> Beatlemania. Anybody that's four guys in long hair, you scream, and the DJs are telling you to do that. That's what you have to do. And so... Wow. So it was horrifying. I mean, it really was scary. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, security... They, no, security hadn't even been invented yet. <laughs> you know, maybe why Frank... Would you, why would you need it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like Frank has security. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Frank has security. Yeah, yeah right. you don't want to know about Frank's security. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, I got to ask you about Woodstock again. One of the other things that I yep. did before I, I came here to talk to you was I, I whipped out my my uh, DVD copy of Woodstock and I went to the section that you're in, and I'm just thinking. Now, do you remember much of that? Because you you look like you might be in the state where you, you might not have recalled it after the fact. I remember everything. Do you? Okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I appreciate the. You know, the fact is I've, I've helped the rumor along because oh, people said, hey, uh, boy, you were really stoned at Woodstock, huh? And I, they were highly entertained, and I don't, yeah, sure. But the fact is I'm a New York guy, so what do I do when, for the 14th time, going up on that stage, somebody offers you, oh, here, have some, uh, well, it's sort of like DMT, uh, but, uh, it, well, some other guys are saying it's sort of more like THC. Uh, and uh, I, I turned it down about 14 times until it began to rain. I said, yeah, uh, let me chip off one, a piece of that. And so uh, whatever that was, and I, I still don't know, uh, I, I, because my life had not been a psychedelic one, yeah. uh, and I didn't have experience, I definitely had a, a, a psychedelic glow on there. But the fact is, that excitement, that was stemming from walking out on a stage with a million people. Yeah, looking at those people, that was incredible. Yeah, well, or we, half a million. We or for half a million, or however many it was. Two hundred. We'll change. never, we'll never know. <laughs> uh, we talked on this program a while ago. We talked to Graham Nash, and he was talking about, you know, their experience <laughs> with Stock the Guys, and he, and and of course, he was the only one at that point who had all kinds of experience professionally on stage. So as he said, he was the only one who wasn't nervous. The rest of them were just scared out of their mind. You weren't. You performed a lot at that point. That it, it, other than looking at the total number of people that you were standing in front of, you weren't that. Uptight about it, were you? No, no, yeah. no. That wasn't my problem. 
I had, uh, after the spoonful, been playing as many single shows, one guy, one guitar, that I could do just to accumulate uh, experience and, and uh, you know, to feel convincing on a stage by myself, which I had a little bit before the spoonful, but really it was something I had to learn. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the auto harp earlier, and I got I, I can't not address this. Honest to God, I, the Love and Spoon will have the only rock band in existence that had a their lead guy playing an auto harp occasionally. <laughs> that was always, and us old folkies are going, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, nobody else was doing that, were they? No, they weren't. Uh, eventually, they were. Yeah. Uh, the critters who did a tune of the Spoonfuls did eventually bring along an auto harp, I believe. And uh, but there are a number of there are a number of spoonful songs. When you think in terms of how an auto harp sounds, there just the, the strumming of those chords. A number of spoonful songs sound like they could all start with the strumming of an auto harp. Yes, that they were part of the creation of the songs. It seems to me. Oh yeah, well yeah. definitely. Uh, I was using that uh, heat wave uh, chord cadence as, as often as possible. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I got to ask you about the about Zal leaving the band because that was a, it was a big deal at the time. I think it was probably what 1967 or something. Yeah, right? he got busted on a marijuana charge in San Francisco. Was it? Band is forever for, uh, can never be what it should have been because of that event. Yeah. It was a real tragedy, and yeah, he did get busted, and uh, 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 then uh, had to turn in the guy he bought the pot from or he was going to be sent back to Canada. And that was like looking at these same guys who'd been saying, we'll do anything, we'll do it for the guys in the band. We'll do anything, we'll do it for the guys in the band. And now here was his new thing that he had to do right. for the guys in the band, and it was horrible. What was the, what was the backlash from that? Was there fan backlash from that? Yes, eventually. Yeah. Uh, there was certainly efforts uh, from our office to kind of keep it under wraps. That never worked. Uh, but essentially, it prevented the spoonful from going to California for crucial months. It also was a time when... Uh, uh, Hey, even uh, some of our friends in the music world had to kind of look away because they, you know, we couldn't be part of, uh, uh, you know, some pretty wonderful uh, uh, music yeah. festivals, yeah. including ones that could have uh, showed us to be highly superior to yeah. a number of the bands. Uh, maybe I wouldn't go as far as Otis, but... A number of those yeah. bands, we played better. Yeah. You would have played Monterey, basically, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Would, yeah. Monterey would have been it. Yeah. Monterey yeah. would have been uh, definitely, yeah. yeah. That would have been so, a game changer. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, and I wanted to talk to you about you know, all the stuff you've done. We've been dwelling in the past for so long here, but you've done all kinds of stuff since. The band gets inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame back in 2000, I think, because I remember doing, I was at CBC Radio at the time, I remember doing a phone interview with Zal when that, from the, the hall when it happened. Yeah. Um, but you've done, like, you've continued to play. You, can, you, you do instructional stuff. Uh, you did a lot of music and, and things for animation. And, of course, yes, there is Welcome Back, Cotter. Which That's right. Like, you know, was... how much of a surprise, i got to ask you, how much of a surprise for you was that? Did they come along and commission you to do that because they had this TV show? Was that how it worked? Okay. The television show had uh, a, 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 few, um, a few episodes done. Um, uh, and there were scripts, and I talked to one guy. Uh, thank God. He was a cool Brooklyn guy who uh, said, look, we're looking for New Yorker-type songwriters for this job because it's a, it's a Brooklyn thing. It's a New York thing. Uh, I said, well, I'm your guy. Uh, and uh, then I found out the subject matter, and I said, no, nah, I'm really your guy because I was one of these guys that you... These, I was a sweat hog. <laughs> okay. And uh, so they... Uh, within a day of hearing the song, they had changed the title of the show to Welcome Back, Cotter. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, interesting. And then, and then you got a number one 
hit out of that, did you not? I did. It would have been the song of the year, but just to keep me humble, that went to Disco Duck. <laughs> You're not serious. I'm dead serious. Disco Duck beat you out? Good <laughs> Lord, that's <laughs> terrible. That's crazy. Well, in, in my opinion, just before we... Uh, there's one last question I want to ask, but I, I wanted to pass this along. In my opinion, one of the best songs ever, and one that I have loved ever since the first time I heard it, and it's one of yours, and that's Darling Be Home Soon. I think that's just a fabulous tune. Uh, that came out of uh, having Francis Coppola as a... Uh, as a Q man, uh, he, he had employed me to uh, do what was about his second movie called You're a Big Boy Now yes. with a Canadian star. That's right. Uh, don't, I, don't do this to me. I can't I, remember I, 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 I can I, see his face, but I can't remember. I can remember. see his face, yeah. right. Uh, and uh, he uh, took me into a, a viewing room and showed me a, a, a sequence that was a, a romance sequence in the movie and he said now you know we want uh, I'm, I'm gonna play uh, we got Monday Monday on the track right now because it's sort of in the right general mood but here's you know I'll play it with that and uh, so I think I had fragments of the song already so I I realized that it really would fit, and uh, it's a beautiful song. Yeah. I love it. Okay, my last question to you, and it's a two-parter, and I don't think it'll take you long to answer. But part one: Does jug band music still make you feel just fine? And part two is: Do you still believe in the magic of rock and roll? Yes, and yes. Uh, I the. Punchline for my jug band career came right at the end of uh, uh, my uh, involvement with uh, the J Band, which was a jug band that was kind of trying to accumulate as many of the great jug banders from the 60s, not, not the <laughs> 30s, that we could have. And, of course, I had drafted Fritz Richmond, which was, to me, the big victory, and then uh, had come up with Paul Rochelle and Annie Raines, a wonderful little blues duo. Before that, we had Jimmy Vivino and James Wormworth, who are both guys that are currently on Conan O'Brien's uh, band. And uh, uh, so out of nowhere, I got a telephone call from a musician who told me that Yank Racial was living in Indianapolis, Indiana. Yank Racial being a genius mandolin player, uh, very original ideas, very jazzy chords in this completely rough blues setting of playing with Sleepy John Estes, playing with uh, Sonny Boy Williamson, the first Sonny Boy. Well, I ended up on a telephone with Yank, and I said, man, you know, we got a lot of great guitar players up here in New York, but nobody can play mandolin like you. He goes, well, you tell me where to come. <laughs> it, was, it was like a challenge. And uh, about a week later, I was in the studio, Fritz Richmond, Jimmy Vivino, Chris Anderson, a great uh, recordist from uh, uh, from here in New York, in uh, in Woodstock, and we recorded uh, an album, and it included Yank Racial, an original jug bander. Yeah, that was uh, an amazing moment. I bet. And as far as rock and roll, playing with Johnny Johnson and playing with Hubert Sumlin, which I got a chance to do fairly regularly. Okay just because of LeVon Helms' barn, yes. which is here in Woodstock. Absolutely. Herbert Sumner. This has been great, John. I appreciate you giving us all this time. This has been fabulous. It's oh, been a great pl pleasure to meet you, too. Certainly Thanks a lot. welcome. Okay. Certainly welcome. Thank you. <laughs>